I'm really premenstrual. <laughs> Looking at you, yeah. I'm just trying to remember what I was saying before. Okay. okay. Can, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll just blab on and yeah, then <laughs> get. Should I rephrase that? Did I sound racist? <laughs> This is cool. This is like <gasps> planes, big hoon cars, vroom, 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 you know. I just lost my thought then. Far up. Sorry, guys, this interview is not easy. I think I've always been creative. I get told stories of when I was a kid, I would sing all the time and perform for whoever came over. Auntie Ray Uppy tells the story about, oh, we would just point at things and say, Dodo, sing a song about the TV. And apparently I would just make one up on the spot. And I have memories in primary school of like rocking up and saying, oh, Mrs. Day, I heard an amazing song yesterday. Can I perform it for the class? So I was kind of out there and then puberty started. And then I went from not, thinking about how I was seen to wanting to not be seen. I remember in infant school going up to play with gang at lunchtime and I still remember her name which is hilarious, Nicole Thornton saying, no we don't play with blackies and me just going oh okay and you know um, and that's that's just burned into my brain. Mum brought us up and she said you always have to be better than everybody else because you are brown that's just how it is and that we all have to be um, above average to be considered average. I was always trying to fit in was the thing. And it was only towards the end of high school that I started to realise that I didn't have to feel bad about being different and being brown. Almost every woman I know is, is fierce, who is in the arts, who is in CCD, who is in filmmaking coming out of Western Sydney. And I don't know if that's just a, a personality trait that everyone has in common or if it's because we've had to be but it's fantastic. As a woman, I think when you pursue what you want to do, I feel like you're more judged. Since they are objectified, they really understand and value what it, um, value supporting each other. And I feel like it's sad that we only understand the value of something because we lack it powerful. The first thing I think of when I hear the word woman or female is how powerful we can be when we all come together and we kind of fight for what's right. Well growing up you know in an Asian household <laughs> your parents are always you know, oh, become a doctor, become a lawyer, do something that will earn you a lot of money and you know you can do whatever you want after you've gotten all this money. It is a lot of pressure and I understand that they want me to be able to take care of myself and maybe even them when I'm older. While it comes from a good place, it's, it's very taxing on the person you're forcing other things onto. I didn't really explain to them what I was doing, so... <laughs> so I didn't really explicitly tell my parents that I was going to film school. I was just like, oh yeah, I got into this college and I'm doing this degree. And then they're like, so what are you doing? Oh, you know, this thing like like video filming, you know, like kind of like for marketing or advertising. So then they went out and, oh yeah, she's out doing marketing. I really wanted to get into film school. Like I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So a lot of spoken word raps and I've been an actor. I write songs as well and I'm a very much of a giver and a sinner. You spend a lot of time alone. <laughs> You're being judged by the public. And people always ask me, do you have a job? Do you have a job? I just wish for more love, more compassionate towards artists and to appreciate the fact that we just work as twice as hard. I come from the underclass, an underclass you know, world, so I had to climb a lot further than other people to get to a, just a baseline of confidence. When I was in primary school in Bidwall, I had a teacher who we just did drama all the time. Ever since then, I've just always, that's what I wanted to do. It was like the, the kind of thing that, that, that I that I felt most alive. Because I was living in the city and at that time, like in the 90s, um, late 90s, I, I, um, I didn't really talk about being from Western Sydney and I didn't talk about any of that part of my identity. And so I was trying to, I suppose, assimilate into, I suppose, more middle class kind of cultures and, um, 
And also, I, I'm gay, so that kind of became... Um, it was quite scary at the time to kind of come out on stage. There aren't many people were doing it then. As a woman um, and an actor, I thought that, you know, I was just going to get lots of roles and... But there weren't really any really interesting roles for women and I realised at a very young age there was... I was either someone's wife or someone's girlfriend or... Um, and supporting them doing very cool things. And also, when I was acting, I was always at auditions and, but no one would ever give me the part because of the way I looked. And, um, but then I just realised that every time I put my own work on, someone would give me a role. And I started to get into a lot of short films, um, a lot of like after short films and things like that. So I kept, I kept doing it that way. So I could position myself as an artist and as an actor and rather than leaving it up to other people. And then I kind of really was struggling a lot because particularly becoming a, like, you know, wanting to kind of move away from performing in other people's work and becoming my own artist. That's when I started to get into trouble because um, it got really, I got really confused because the type of work I wanted to make um, in a city, con like, you know, projects, I was casting kind of um, different performers from all over Australia in these kinds of works that were essentially stories about my life in Western Sydney. And, and then one day, it was in my mid-30s, I had a bit of an epiphany that I um, need to base my practice in Western Sydney because that's the stories I want to tell. I think there's a big history coming from Mount Druid and also being part of the Forgotten Australians, I needed to work out how to talk. And that's something that was a really, as a leader, that was something that I really um, worked very hard on. I think I fell in love with the community part of the arts. I was surrounded by strong women um, who ran that organisation or worked in that organisation, including an Arab Australian woman who I related a lot to, even though she was older than me. Being in a community arts organisation made me feel prouder about my heritage because when I was younger, I pretended to not be a Muslim girl, I went to Fairfield Public School and I was the only, my brother and I were the only Muslim kids. I felt like I needed to be liked by the white kids. So I told them I was, you know, my family converted to Christianity and I remember that day very clearly so I can stop going to the Muslim scripture. I felt like that was, you know, where I was being separated from the rest. The kind of professional, People I've worked with um, that have inspired me are all women. The ones who've had a kind of big impact, a positive impact, um, have been the women, that are, uh, the women that I've worked with and continue to work with. I am raised by a single mother and I have two sisters. The influence of strong women has like really impacted my life and my craft and who I am as a person. So as my first poem that I ever performed, ever, I felt like I fed off the energy of the strong women around me. I've always been creative as much as, like, as far back as I can remember. My father was um, an artist himself in both um, paint medium, sculpture, graphic design, and also 3D gaming, which he used to do. I was a bit of a daddy's girl, so I wanted to follow in his footsteps and be an artist like him. My parents had a digital camera, Cybershot. I would like to go to my, out in my backyard and see the sunset. And I just started taking photos then, really. That was kind of more of a little hobby, but I felt like it was more of a creative outlet while studying for my HSC. One of the biggest memories I have was when I started, like my second job in, at uni was, a photograph, was photography. So that's how I started getting into photography. But I remember my mother, when we we're going to see a family gathering, my mum was like saying, oh, uh, if auntie asks what you're working, you know, just say you're a graphic designer, not a photographer. And I remember saying, why? That's, what, that's my job. I'm taking photos, I'm getting paid for it. And I'm actually making fair money at that time. And she's like, oh yeah, but you know, they're, they're not going to see it that way. You're hurt. And I was just like, I'm not a graphic designer, I'm a photographer. And I love what I do. I found that I was really interested in filmmaking. And, you know, at the back of my mind, I started identifying myself as a storyteller. And at the same time, 
I was having this, you know, working in the space as a social worker and seeing, you know, certain things that people are going through, for example, you know, mental health issues, homelessness and um, domestic violence. And I thought, oh, you know, these are not things that we necessarily see on TV, you know, the stories are not being told. And one of the things that really drove me more to lean towards filmmaking was that I feel like I can help these people, but on a bigger scale, you know, in order to contribute to society, we actually need to, you know, put this out there and have the conversation about it. I really love to um, create things, whether it's through filmmaking or other art forms to help young women to reflect on who they are and to see how they can bring positive changes to their lives. I was always a supporting person throughout my creating, uh, creative endeavours, similar to a lot of women in this sector. We like to see projects happen, we, we like to be the nurturer, we like to be a part of something. But leadership and then going, hey, I'm going to take that risk, is something a lot of artists tend to not choose. There are a lot of great female directors out there and I'm lucky to be working with, you know, a mostly female team and have people around me who definitely encourage me. But I think in general, it's still something that's just so far behind. I think one of the biggest challenges, and I feel this a lot personally, is people not taking you seriously and not being heard. Um, your opinion being taken as second, second rate. Um, as someone who's loud and opinionated, I find this, it, it drives me mad. You know, seeing that, yes, I'm getting opportunities, but am I really, truly going to get the opportunity that I really want? And for me, that was to one day create an action flick where I can be in as a lead and have that made in Australia. And some people might go, oh, but you've got to focus on one thing, either acting or directing or whatever. Don't diversify. But then I said to myself, what about the great people out there, like Jackie Chan, Donnie Yen, and all those people? You know, these are my role models. These are my male Asian action hero role models. Why can I not have a path to pursue like that? In fact, I will. The great thing is if you get, if you have an idea and you, you're bold enough to put yourself out there, there are so many people out there that will help you. I look back and I realise I can do all these things. And it's a good feeling. You actually realise there are people out there that you can, you can actually connect with. When you've been looking for so long and you go into artistic industry, people are probably going to... People probably thought, really? <laughs> Of all things you want to get into, I mean, film. Finding the right people to connect with, you realise that all your ideas and all your ambitions can actually can actually can actually become a reality. I, I couldn't imagine my life any other way now. Your journey is never linear. Yeah, it's hardly linear. It always goes in a you know curly whirly way. But every action you you take is always an action forward. Even though in the moment you might think, that's stupid, why? That, I just made my, an ass in front of people. At the same time I realised, okay, I did it. I'm not the, as confident as I am now. Because before, I was very afraid. I was very small, to the point that I remembered in high school, each time people asked, like we would go around the room reading um, a paragraph of a book, and I would struggle with that. The words couldn't come out. You know, there's a, there was a point that, that I wanted to change. I think I, I remembered, I was like, you know, I can't live like this. And that's when I decided to go, you know what, I wanted to be a good speaker. Looking back at what I have achieved in the last 46 years of my life in Australia, I always go back to that defining moment. That moment that says, you choose the path. So the first 15 years of my life, I lived, um, in another part of the world. And all of a sudden I had to, um, you know, learn a new language, make new friends. And it was, it was tough. It was really tough. On the third day of my school um, attendance, I was assaulted on a school bus. 
by a group of girls um, and I learned later that the reason was because I couldn't speak English. Um, so, you know, right now speaking to you, um, I can actually see myself flat on that, um, flat on my face on that school bus, you know, humiliated, um, distraught, didn't know what to do. But at that moment there was, there was really two options for me. You know, either give in to the bullies and become a victim of bullying for the rest of my life, or stand up and face reality, learn English and prove the critics wrong. I actually found my voice at Flemington Market. I remember my father used to say, um, he used to say, wise people are those who think about what they say seven times and if they know that it's not going to hurt anyone, what, what, what they are about to say is not hurting anyone, then they should come out with it. Otherwise, don't. And I remember when I was growing up, I, always, I used to think about a certain something that I wanted to say to either my friends or the group. Of, I would think about it seven times and by the seventh time, that thought became so not important anymore. So I kept quiet. So I was very quiet growing up. But when I was put in a position to sell my product, I found my voice at, at Flemington Market. I stood there waiting for people to say something for three frustrating hours and no one said it. And I, I could, nothing came out from my mouth. And I was so disheartened. I was about to pack up and go home and forget everything. But then I thought, hang on, these people have no idea what I'm doing here. I've got to talk to them. So that's when I approached them and then started telling them about the product that I created for my daughter. And, and then that, you know, everyone was so receptive to what I was saying. Everyone wanted to have their eyebrows done. I found my voice at Flemington Market. That was yet again another defining moment. I used to love reading and writing. So as a child, I used to write a lot and I used to read a lot. But I think the first thing that got me up and thinking creatively was comedy. So in high school, I was um, always jumping up to do comedy skits and stuff at school and concerts and impersonating characters and teachers and stuff. So, so yeah, about 15 was my first public performance. Um, some radio sponsored gong show or something, I was a finalist. I think I've consistently um, encountered opposition and uh, sometimes scorn, sometimes ridicule when I speak my mind. I have a very big voice, I have a loud voice, I have a deep voice. I'm constantly getting defeminized because of my voice. I'm constantly getting, uh, you know, told to settle down or st stop being angry or what. It's like, well, this is my voice. It's like a five octave voice. I've got guns, I'm telling you. This is a big voice. I can get quite sensitive about it sometimes, but you know, the last few years I've just gone stuff it. Sort of refuse to sound like anybody else. It was in the 90s, early 90s. 1991, I think, and I was early in my 20s, <laughs> um, and that was the first ethnic reporter role that was created uh, by the Fairfax Community Newspaper. They were recognising the, obviously at the time, the Indo-Chinese refugee settlement. Back in those days, we were called Nesby, non-English speaking background reporter. And I was the first <laughs> ethnic face, if you can call it that, or Asian face, that um, got, you know, that, that got that role. So at the time, uh, mainstream media was very predominantly white Anglo-Saxon, um, and in particular white Anglo-Saxon men as well. So, you know, of course it didn't occur to me then what, that I was the only one because I, I didn't see colours. I, I just thought I wanted to tell, well, I wanted to do something meaningful. I didn't even realise that I love storytelling. My people come from the Gomeroy, Wiradjuri and Yulmanara nations of New South Wales. I'm Aboriginal, American Indian and Chinese. Um, and I'm a storyteller, but I'm not a storyteller in the kind of generic sense. So my great auntie Iris told me that I was going to be the next storyteller of my family when I was 12 years old. She was the storyteller of our family then until she passed away. I've always had a sense of wanting to help people. 
in whatever way, shape or form that was. As a kid I thought I was going to join the UN, make some great change or something, but I just tripped and stumbled in, into the arts and I didn't, know, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in that industry, but I knew that's where I wanted to kind of make a home for myself. I had a story that they said, okay, you can go out and cover this story, right? So I went with a producer, we went out, and I was supposed to be the reporter. Um, came back and sat with the editor to edit the, the, this news piece, it's one and a half minute. That's, that's how long the length of the story was. And I, was, I had put down my voiceover for the story, and then um, I can't remember how, somebody, one of the news director came and said, oh look, um, we can't use you on the story. And I was putting my voice, oh, why? Um, he goes, because um, you've got braces on, so we can't really use, and I did have braces on. I thought, oh. That day, that night, I felt tremendously kind of disappointed, sad, that said, I can't, I don't feel that I belong. You know, I said, I have to work harder because I wasn't good enough to do that one and a half minute piece. And I, and I had this feeling that it was because of my accent, but they couldn't say it. You know, this one institution where I thought Rip is supposed to be, you know, embracing diversity of voices, perspectives and stories, and can't even actually give me that hands up. Ignored, unheard, underestimated, invisible to, although I think, I think that's definitely changing, but I mean the truth is if we don't make noise we don't get seen, whereas I think other artists don't have to do that. The problem is, is butting up against that system that still can't take those chances and still doesn't want to let the door open just a little bit. Where American screen industries and English screen industries consistently um, take risks, um, and let self-determined, diverse stories through to, to just shine. You know, Australia still waits to see when it's safe to take a little step, and even then, who calls the shots on those little steps that we are allowed to take? We still are not seen as having uh, creative uh, narrative currency as creators. You know, we can work with anybody, um, but just let us, let us listen to what we're saying. Sometimes I feel like the only things people will accept my poetry for and the themes that they'll accept is things about, you know, multi like diversity, always questioning about like Islamophobia, like gendered stuff. I feel like I can never talk about like human things. I really want to like one day share poetry about like my dad and kind of how he was a dropkick. <laughs> Poetry about the experiences I had with a single mother, poems about like love, and I feel like no one really wants to hear that from me because that's the stuff white poets do. They only want to hear me or accept my art whenever I talk about my identity. I'm a person. Not everything I produce has to be protest. I can see that in the way that um, the way some people review work or. Um, discuss work and I was like well do you expect a white person to only talk about white struggle? And I think that comes from you know the lack of representation especially in the media and um, you know them not being able to see themselves on TV or in the magazines and that is actually some people might see that as something minor but for someone like me like if I don't see myself there I feel like I don't belong I'm, I'm black, I'm queer, I'm a woman, and I'm young. They're four of Australia's biggest kind of minorities, you know. I come from a very diverse area, but I'm sick of having to explain myself over and over again to those, that white heteronormative executives and producers and the funders. I guess as like a kind of Viva La Revolution, that's why I went and worked with Create New South Wales, so I could become a producer myself. It's going to shift sooner or later. Or we just find alternative markets and alternative platforms to do our own thing. And you know what? 
it can happen now. It couldn't happen 20 years ago. We didn't have YouTube, we didn't have Netflix, we didn't have web series. It can happen now and it's happening now. You know, indie, indie's the way to go. Stop waiting for that phone to ring. It's just not gonna happen. You know. In some ways, we don't even have to worry about mainstream media anymore. We can just, and it's not even about working around them now. It's just like going in that direction. You stay over there, it's all cool. I've gotten to the point where I do see myself as a leader but that took a while, <laughs> it took a while to get there. I'm a director of my own life, you know, and I feel like everyone is a leader in their own ways as well. You don't have to have a whole crowd following you to be a leader. Every great person out there, every leader, have a set of leaders that are standing next to them, helping them, supporting them, as well as them supporting. I'm supporting them, they're supporting me. Leadership for me is strength, but it's, <sighs> It's beyond me, but it's the strength and the power that you have that you can lift everyone up so that it ripples effects from others. I love doing that. I love showing that a young person say, hey brother, do you have a dream? I met this young fellow out in the back of Burke and I was like, have you got a dream? And he's like, what, what's that? The dude was in, what, year seven? It broke my heart. For my six-year-old sister, the fact that I'm in the arts and working in film sets and kicking ass like other white people that we've seen for years on screen. Now my little six-year-old sister can grow up in a world believing that that's possible. Being an artist isn't just producing beautiful work like for fashion or campaigns that come and go. It's work that will last and, and have a strong impression on people, but touch and connect with people. And I do that with my artwork, that I want to create things that affect people, not just look pretty or, um, you know, that, or represent. I actually want to connect with people at a human level, creating work that connects with people for the small screen. To have different faces in front of the screen, and I want to be working on a team where we have different faces behind the camera. And I want to bring Brown to TV Town. That's another thing I have on my vision board. There is like a collateral collaborative energy that I feel that will allow us to be sustainable in the industry. There's power in the we. I find that things really start to happen when you realise that you are part of a collegiate spirit of women who want to uh, generate change through their creativity. I feel like people need to get out of their office spaces and connect with the everyday people and not just rely on you know, really talented people to kind of write the stories of people they don't really know and allow people to speak for themselves and tell their own stories. I think that's really important. If you really want to do it, you've got to just keep going. I feel like everything now is aligned in my identity, my, my identity and my practice. I really needed to own who I was and I found that really a, a really long journey. Things that you might think are your um, that people see as your weaknesses, whether it be your, you know, any part of your identity or the way you look, then you, they're, your, they're your actual strengths and you need to just own them and, and make art about those things that scare you or frighten you um, about yourself. We want to be able to go, hey, we're here for the long run. We are the next generation of creative artists, of filmmakers, of content creators. And we have something important to say. We are Australian. We have a voice and we want to tell and recreate new stories for us to be seen on screen.